U.S.-Mexican border as it is un herida abierta, where the third world breaks against the first and bleeds. And before a scab forms, it hemorrhages again, the lifeblood of two worlds merging to form a third country, a border culture. Borders are set up to define the places that are safe and unsafe, to distinguish us from them. A border is a dividing line, a narrow strip along a steep edge. A borderland is a vague and undetermined place, created by the emotional residue of an unnatural boundary. It is in a constant state of transition. The prohibited and forbidden are its inhabitants. My name is Guadalupe Savannah Maria Shira Gallegos. It's a long name, I know. I'm from Villanueva in Las Vegas, and New Mexico is all I have known my entire life. The quote I've just read to you is by Gloria Anzaldua in her 1987 book, Borderlands, La Frontera, the New Mestiza. Borderlands, both the theme of today's showcase and the book, describe situations like the above, and especially the situation of New Mexico. Being a border state and also one of only six majority minority states in the entire United States, a little more than half of the population is Hispanic, while about 8% of the population are, in, are indigenous people from one of our 19 tribes, including Genesados. Also, interestingly enough, a majority of the Hispanic Nuevo Mexicanos today are Jewish, of Sephardi descent after their ancestors fled the Inquisition. The word crypto-Jew is often used to describe these books as they hid their identity and beliefs under the guise of being Catholic missionaries. If any of you are archaeology buffs like me, you might know about the Clovis people a semi-nomadic people that lived about 13,000 years ago. The Clovis people existed as the ancestors of over 80% of all indigenous people of both North and South America. And they were first discovered right here in Clovis, New Mexico, where they hunted bison on the lowland grasslands during the last glacial period. We were also home to ancient Puebloans that occupied the Four Corners region a little less than 1,000 years ago. Remnants of their existence in time here is everywhere if you look hard enough. Some of you may have even visited these sites if you went on Southwest Studies or on Project Week last year, from Chaco Canyon to Mesa Verde or the, the Guia Cliff Drawings. In the 16th century, the Spanish, on a quest for God, glory, and gold, established colonies in New Mexico in which they implemented the encomienda system, a system of slavery in which indigenous people often had no choice but to work in servitude or suffer the sudden rampant disease, lack of resources, and other warring tribes. This created the Costa system, in which Spaniards were at the top, mixed mestizo children were second, and indigenous people last. Indigenous people revolted many times, most successfully during the Pecos Revolt, in which the Spanish were kicked for a successful 12 years. They eventually returned with new treaties, but this event stands as a significant symbol of indigenous resistance still practiced by indigenous people today. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about Montezuma. Montezuma, New Mexico, is an especially interesting village in terms of history. Before it was known as Montezuma, this area was called Los Ojos Calientes by the Mestizo locals. In the years prior to settlement, the natural hot springs here in Montezuma were a therapeutic and valued area to the indigenous groups, specifically to the Puebloan people. But by 1840, the land was bought and turned into a tourist attraction and was consequently named Mont and was consequ consequently named Montezuma. The Hot Springs Hotel was built, which was later turned into the Old Stone Hotel, and then Montezuma Castle. It was deemed a national treasure that was the site of international attraction for years, and it still is. The area we know as Montezuma today used to be the settlement of the Jicarilla Apache, the Pecos peoples, and to a lesser extent, the nomadic Comanches. After years of being ravaged by disease, famine, war, and relocation by the U.S. government, however, the Jicarilla Apache Nation was given a small reservation in the San Juan Basin by Dulce. The land was and still is unsuitable for sustainable agriculture, and Jicarilla Apache people to this day hold no right to their holy places of worship in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains right here in Montezuma. The Comanche Nation was forcibly relocated to Lot in Oklahoma. Many people of both of these tribes have had to abandon their reservations in search of work opportunities elsewhere, as indigenous reservations continue to rank highest in poverty rates across the country. And today, Pecos Pueblo is known only as a national monument. It is federally considered extinct, and what used to be the home of the largest indigenous group in all of New Mexico is now nothing more than a tourist.
tourist attraction east of Santa Fe. But the history of the Pueblo and its people is important. Pecos Pueblo was known as Sicuique, the village of 500 warriors by its people, and as Sicuaya by the Spanish colonists. The Beaquia, as they called themselves, were a major trading group connecting both Pueblo and Plains people of the Southwest. They were a regional power, cultured in art, science, and spirituality. They persisted through colonization, foreign disease, genocide, and war on the behalf of the Spanish colonists. In the latter 1800s, however, the last people of Pecos Pueblo, only totaling a mere hundred, left to join their sister tribe in Jemez Pueblo and their mestizo relatives in small villages across northern New Mexico. If you've ever taken a history class, at some point you might hear that those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And while the sentiment is nice, even today, with all the knowledge we have about indigenous people, we as a nation and even as a campus here in Montezuma continue to perpetuate harm against the indigenous people we claim to care about. Plateau and PNM, our providers of electricity, have notoriously broken federal guidelines and their own standards for public safety and environmental preservation. They actively dump their waste on Navajo Nation land, devastating the already arid environment and polluting groundwater wells that indigenous people used to survive. By failing to commit to cleaner energy and cleaner companies, we actively contribute to the issues still faced by indigenous people to this day. I don't tell you this to guilt trip you or to bore you with a history lesson, but I tell you this so that we as a community can develop a greater sense of accountability beyond our small community here in Montezuma. But there is still more to New Mexico than this. As Anne Zaluwa writes, to survive the borderlands, you must live sin fronteras via crossroads. Now, before I finish, I want to tell you a little bit about my borders. When my grandmother was born, the word Genesaro was listed under her race on the census. To anyone foreign to northern New Mexico, this term won't mean anything. But to those of us that call El Norte home, it means everything that we are. My grandmother was born a servant near the bottom of the casta system that had ended on paper but not in policy. She, like her mother, was a stolen wild woman, captured and married by my ancestral Spaniard grandfather for the encomienda. I often wonder about what connection she was given in secrecy, in the hopes that she could one day return home. She and her mother might have spoken fluently in Toa, but to this day we will never know what they said, as this language has been stolen from us and has no written form. What I imagine when I think of those late nights spent making sopa pies by the wood stove on a late evening, as she and her mother mourned together, is that she told my grandmother to run. To run and make a fuss and never let the Spaniard tame her. To run and teach her children to run and their children after that. To never stop being a wild woman and instill that sense of resilience in generations after her, so that one day she could return home through her descendants. When I talk to my elders about this, I am often told that every instance we yearn to find our people, it is our ancestral mother's continued battle to return home. It is our call to Cadencia, the place where we are our most authentic selves. To my grandmother, Cadencia may have been the adobe house she built with her own bare hands with her daughters. And to my aunties and sisters, I think that their Cadencia is that little village on the hill tucked away like a special piece of heaven, a remnant of slow-moving time that has yet to catch up. And for me, Cadencia is the ongoing battle for federal recognition, land grant, and a secular rights that I fight with many of my siblings across northern New Mexico every day. It is telling the story of my grandmother so that I may inspire others to keep fighting those battles, even if we may not win before our time is up. I have learned to be wild, like my grandmother, and to run even when it's uphill and easy to give up. It's perseverance and resilience in the face of storms bigger than we could ever comprehend. So, as the night goes on, I'd like to ask all of you here, what are your borders? What is your cadencia? Thank you.